coronavirus pandemic is ushering space design into a new era from which there is no turning back. The design is emerging as human-centric, flexible and adaptable, with blended uses and inextricable from its economic context. The Los Angeles architecture and design firm Omgivning recently released a series of post-pandemic design reports under the general title Reimagining Spaces. These reports focus on the adaptive reuse of buildings for workplaces, multifamily, and urban reprogramming. Joining us today to discuss her firm's urban reprogramming solutions is Karen Liljegren, principal. BDNC has also published an article that highlights the main points of each report. Welcome to the weekly, Karen. Thank you. Thanks for having me. First off, I want to let our audience know that your firm's name, Om, Om Givning, is Swedish for environment, setting, and ambiance. So that can kind of set, set the bar for what we're going to talk about, uh, about uh, one of your reports. Your firm's conceptual ideas for urban reprogramming revolve around the creative reuse of vacant and underused commercial spaces. Can you explain why your firm believes these spaces need to evolve into something else? And what are some of your design strategies? Sure. Um... Well, let's see. So first of all, we, we kind of specialize in adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Um, and typically we do a lot of office buildings that are being converted into hotel or housing um, or a different type of office or very mixed use. So when the pandemic was starting to happen, we said, oh, you know, because we had a little less work. <laughs> so we're like, how can we use our energies to do something, uh, you know, use our creative problem solving skills. So it's like, what are, what are the buildings that we see that might be really impacted by this pandemic? So we specifically sought after some just case study buildings um, in Los Angeles, which, you know, can be anywhere. So the first was um, a strip shopping mall. So obviously we know that retail and uh, retail was already kind of diminishing a little bit and increased vacancies prior to the pandemic. And this is, this is only going to increase. Um, so we looked at um, how a shopping mall could be converted into housing, which isn't something that no some pe people normally think about, but really there's a lot of situations in which this is kind of a perfect adaptive reuse of this building type. So just in Los Angeles alone, there are 675 strip malls, which cover 24 million square feet of ground area. And um, they're often set back from the street. They usually have a lot of parking. They usually have a lot of gl glass on the front and the depths are significantly deep. Um, and so it really lays out very well to, to take um, these buildings for housing. So the, the model that we used is an L-shaped building. It's in West LA, um, you know, and there's a bunch of, uh, you know, there's the surface parking and then there's the below grade parking. So the majority of the circulation, um, vertical circulation as well as horizontal can remain. Um, and then approximately every storefront could accommodate two 600 foot units, um, which all kind of center and face on the parking area, which would then turn into like this beautiful garden and common area. Also strip malls tend to be on commercial corridors. Um, so they, they have great access to other parts of the city. Um, so they really kind of lay out pretty easily. Um, the second one was a little bit more ambitious and we're like, hey, you know, big box is, you know, really transforming. <laughs> um, and big box, you're talking about like Costco or Walmart? Yes, big box retail. So, um, you know, obviously since the 60s, this has kind of become a signature of American retail environment. There's 8.5 billion square feet of retail space in the country, which is 25 square feet per person. Um, and as we all know, we're at home buying and the packages are coming and we're not really going to the stores. And even after this pandemic, um, we'll be going back to stores, but certainly not to the degree that we were, say, 10 years ago. Um, I mean, just, just Toys R Us alone ha already has 800 vacant locations across the country. So, you know, the, these kind of big box buildings, um, instead of instead of just coming in with the attitude, oh, well, of course, let's just tear them down and let's build something new. You know, I think that we need to start rethinking that tear something down and build something new. 
Um, you know, experts anticipate that 90% of real estate development in the next decade, decade are going to focus on renovation and reuse of existing structures. Um, you know, we have to think about uh, the greenest building is the one that's already built. You, um, it can take, even if you build a super, you know, energy efficient new building, um, it can take 10 to 80 years for a new building um, to, uh, you know, what was it called, like, uh, combat the actual carbon impact of building a new building. So, you know, so we really, you know, I think people just, it's a, they have a hard time saying, oh, like, a Costco, how can that turn into housing? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we took a we took a stab at looking at one and obviously you would need to carve into it and do a lot of modifications. Um, but it really, you know, it, it kind of lays out interesting. This is, for example, 150,000 square foot Costco um, on a really large site that also has a, a Best Buy and an empty Toys R Us. Um, and a slew of parking, you know, and, and we're, this is, you know, in a pretty dense area of Los Angeles. So the, the Costco itself can house, um, for example, two story townhomes because you have really high ceilings. Um, and then you can carve in some great courtyards. Um, it can, this particular one can get over a hundred, maybe to 120 um, two story townhome units mm -hmm. um, that would have multiple, you know, two to three bedroom. They'd all have a private space, um, outdoor space that would connect then to the larger community space. So it can really also create a great sense of community. And then with the rest of the site, um, you know, then you can build some new construction housing, maybe that's higher density up towards the street, and maybe the space all in between can be these great, um, you know, um, gr green space for residents and for the neighboring, um, uh, for the, the adjacent neighborhood, um, athletic fields, sports courts, uh, urban farming, whatever you want, lots of opportunities there. Um, the next building uh, we looked at is kind of like your standard light industrial building, you know, something that's probably in the 10 to 20,000 square foot range. Like a warehouse, um, sort of? Yeah, so basically warehouses. And, um, you know, certainly all over the country in Los Angeles, um, we have kind of a perimeter around our downtown that has a lot of these buildings, thousands of them. Um, and most of them were built in the 20s. And they're actually loaded with character. They've got great brick walls and bow trusses. And, um, you know, we can, we can make um, this type of building for light industrial is not working anymore, right? You need like bigger industrial buildings that are more um, contemporary. But these smaller, you know, older industrial buildings or warehouses really can create some interesting opportunities. So we looked at it both for office and um, and for housing. So um, with this with this type of scheme, this type of building type, it might be more optimal to kind of turn it more inside because it's not like these are thriving urban areas. They're more um, buildings that don't really have activated pedestrian areas. Um, so maybe these buildings are more about really amazing courtyards and carving in to part of the building and let light and ventilation into that center space. And then it creates a little bit more of a sense of community. So whether it's say smaller offices that are sharing common areas, which by the way is um, we see as a, as, a, as a trend moving forward, that's a little bit of a blend of it's not co-working and it's not private offices. It's a little bit of a blend um, so that you can have your private office space um, because you may also have less uh, workers coming into the office every day. Um, but you may have less workers, but you still have a larger staff group that wants to, say, convene for workshops or meetings or have an event. So this type of model is a great way to have a sense of community, and maybe those private offices are also in the same industry. So maybe it's architecture and engineering or, you know, many different varieties of what it can be. Mm -hmm. So that's one scenario. And then the other scenario is housing. And again, this, uh, this shows where it's a little bit more of a mini community that's turned inwards with a, a really beautiful, you know, uh, outdoor spaces within the building. Um, and then it also, but also creating courtyards, um, it, it, it allows this kind of natural um, ventilation from the outside through the building and then up, um, as well as, again, a sense of community. So there's just some ways to kind of use those buildings. And then the last uh, concept I want to talk about today was 
um, urban ground floor commercial space. So, you know, we have a lot of, you know, before the pandemic, we had a lot of empty ground floor retail space, say in downtown Los Angeles. Um, a lot of times even developers don't put that ground floor into the performa because it's kind of volatile in terms of, you know, the tenants kind of tend to come and go, restaurants have, are, have a lot of volatility. So we, we looked at two kind of operational models that could be ways to think about, there's many ways, but maybe two ways to think about how to reuse some of these ground floor spaces. So the first one, kind of talks about, um, we're calling it a maker's collective, but basically it kind of comes on the idea of the way that a food hall works. So if you think about how food halls are becoming popular, um, it's great because you can have um, smaller spaces um, that smaller vendors or startups can have their own space, right? So. Um, it makes it more affordable for the individuals, uh, individual businesses. And at the same time, it creates kind of a mass of all these people together that have um, presence. So for example, a maker's collective, or it could be an art community, or it could be a technology uh, collective or something. It allows the opportunity for smaller tenancy. So it's more affordable for people to have those spaces. And then, um, then maybe there's, you know, the management company could even be the building management company, or it could be an independent um, master lease for this area that separates these little tenants, you know, and they can share a social media platform, they can share uh, an outdoor space, they can share um, kind of media or PR things or, or someone that's creating events so that they can all kind of benefit um, from the collection. Um, and then the second one is Oh, and, and the main thing is the last thing you want in any urban environment is empty storefronts. That's like the kiss of death for urban living, breathing <laughs> vitality. You have to get people and um, connection to the street. So filling up those storefronts is, is really a critical component. The second one is, you know, there's a lot of restaurants that are becoming empty now and, um, and or just that there's a lot of volatility with restaurants and restaurants are very expensive to build out. Um, and the idea of an office and a restaurant sharing a space might sound a little crazy, but really there's a lot of all the front of house spaces of a restaurant are the same types of spaces that you need in an office. You need, um, you know, those uh, common work, work tables and um, places for people to sit with their laptops. It's comfortable and beautiful and probably like the coffee bar. And those private dining rooms would make great conference rooms. And so you could either um, have a joint venture or it could be part of the same company that owns both of these companies um, to share those spaces. So those are just some ideas. And again, they're, they're meant to be inspirational to, hey, let's think about something that's outside the box or how to reuse the box. Well, Karen, thank you for sharing your ideas with us today. And we'll be interested to see which ones catch on and which <laughs> ones don't. <laughs> uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is John Caulfield from Building Design and Construction. Have a good day. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm.